Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. Uh, my name is Mark Richards. In this lesson, number 140, we'll take a look at governing data services in a microservices ecosystem. You can get a listing of all of my lessons in Software Architecture Monday from my website, developer2architect.com slash lessons. And as a matter of fact, um, most of the material comes from these two books I recently wrote with my friend Neil Ford. Now, in Lesson 75, going back in the Wayback Machine, <laughs> I talked about microservices data services. And as a matter of fact, if you haven't seen that lesson, uh, this would be a good time to pause and actually watch Lesson 75 first, because that will give you a sense of what data services are and the pros and cons of each of those. Now, I wanted to expand on this concept of data services and really talk about uh, governing and also some issues that I've happened to see uh, using this kind of pattern. As a matter of fact, we're going to be focusing on this particular service right here, uh, which is, in fact, a data service. Uh, notice here uh, how this service is basically abstracting the data. Uh, from services that are sharing that particular data. Of course, we do have services that don't share data and ones that maybe do share data that don't use uh, data services. Again, in Lesson 75, I talked about the pros and cons and the trade-offs of these. But I want to address one other topic within these data services. As a matter of fact, uh, let's clean this up a little bit and expand these services a little bit so I can kind of show you uh, one of the issues that actually comes about using microservices data services. Well, let's say that this service here, I'm gonna paint in yellow, uh, needs to access some of the data here in red below that data service. Well. We know from bounded context that I can't directly access that data. I have to ask for that data. Well, look at what happens when I use a data service. So I ask a particular service where that has the particular context for that data I'm looking for. Maybe it's a particular order, for example. Now that microservice needs to then do a remote call over to the data service. That data service needs to query the data comes back into the data service, sends that data up to the regular microservice, which then in turn remotely sends that data back to the service there in yellow. And I know exactly what you're saying. Mark, that's absolutely crazy. Look at how many remote hops are needed just to simply ask for some data. The temptation is to say this, well, Instead of all those hops, why don't I just access that service, that data service directly? I mean, it's still fronting the data, so I'm not actually talking to the data itself, but rather talking to the data service. And as a matter of fact, this is exactly a scenario I did encounter in one of my uh, clients uh, during a consulting engagement. Uh, let me show you um, how I typically govern data services and the real danger in actually doing this practice. Now, certainly it's much faster, it's more optimal, but we have this concept in microservices of a bounded context. And as a matter of fact, we could see three clear bounded contexts here uh, where the service functionality owns the corresponding data. And then that forms a bounded context uh, where I, being that service, am the only one who can access that data. You can't access those tables directly. You have to ask me for that data. And that's the whole notion of a bounded context, uh, really mostly for the purposes of change control within a microservices ecosystem. However, what about when we share data? Well, it turns out that because we're sharing data, we get a broader bounded context. In other words, on the right-hand side here, notice that we've got two services involved in that bounded context because we're sharing the data. And as a matter of fact, similarly, we have a bounded context here as well. 
including the three services plus the data service plus our data. All sits within that bounded context. Now, we have a couple of other things when we use data services, and that happens to be a contract. You see, those three services up here, these ones right here, have to ask the data service for the data. And as a matter of fact, when we do that, we have to have a contract that is still a remote call. Whether we're using REST, gRPC, maybe messaging, it's still a remote call and we still need a contract. Let's say it's just typical loose contract JSON, for example. And so the point is each of these services need different kinds of data forming different contracts within that bounded context. However, what happens if a service outside of our bounded context chooses to talk to our data service directly? Well, it's much faster. We can retrieve data fairly quickly However, I'm sending back that internal representation of the structure of my data. And as a matter of fact, that internal contract is now exposed outside of the bounded context. The significance of that? Well, because the data service is tightly bound to the other services, that forms a contract between those. And as a matter of fact, if I change the internal structure of my data, which shouldn't really matter to anybody else needing that, I certainly have to change the data service. That's where all the SQL, presumably, is stored. But now I have changes to the contract, which also are going to require changes to the service. Now, this is OK because it's all within the scope of the bounded context. It contains those changes. They're internal representations. However, that contract is exposed to other bounded contexts, which now forces that contract to change as well as other services. And you can see the slippery slope happening here, that now I'm changing my internal representation and it is tightly coupling other services and other bounded contexts that need that data. As a matter of fact, there's another slippery slope that is hard to avoid sometimes. And that is getting excited about these data abstraction layers, DALs or data services, as a way of abstracting data and sometimes being able to even version changes. That's what I showed in Lesson 75. However, the problem is as more and more services start using this data abstraction layer, it starts to become an actual data abstraction layer. And this is a slippery slope to start forming layers within our microservices ecosystem, which now completely destroys any bounded context that may be forming. Let's go back to the other scenario, though, where instead of accessing that data service and treating it as an internal component within that bounded context, and I ask another microservice for that data, that is a different contract that I'm exposing outside of my bounded context. That contract there in Turquoise can actually be a different format, a different representation of that data. And I can also now limit what data you should be able to see. And consequently, now that internal contract now remains within the bounded context so that internal representation changes of the structure of my data propagate to those data service contracts, making changes to the microservices there, but not necessarily to the external representation of that data. This is why I actually prefer when I'm governing and using data services to treat the data service itself as an internal private component that is only meant to service just the services within that bounded context, preserving the integrity and privacy of those internal contracts. All right, so that's... Um, 
We'll probably talk more about data services as I start to get more experience seeing these in the wild. Um, but this is yet another consideration um, for governing and accessing data when using data services. Uh, hopefully this gives a, a, a good definition also of preserving that bounded context and the importance of preserving that and what's included in it. So anyways, this has been Lesson 140, uh, Governing Data Services. Um, please stay tuned and uh, two more Mondays for uh, the next lesson in uh, Software Architecture Monday. Thank you so much.